I want to start by saying welcome everyone. My name is Rachel Platt. I am the Director of Community Engagement at the Fraser History Museum in Louisville. And before that, a longtime journalist at WHAS-TV. I thank you for asking me to be part of this very important discussion today. 2020, as you know, marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, granting us the opportunity to reflect on the struggle of women to obtain that right to vote. We have an exhibit at the Fraser right now that is called, What is a Vote Worth Suffrage Then and Now? And trust me, it's not just about the history of the women's movement that's lasted more than 70 years with women being vilified and arrested, or the civil rights movement with blacks being vilified and arrested as we commemorate the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act in 2020. It is also about the current day struggles, the current protests and the protesters, and how many are being vilified and arrested, and how all of these pivotal times and struggles are all intertwined throughout our history and how that work continues today. And today we wanna to focus to get into the details of our history. We wanna focus on suffrage, the stories you know and those you don't names you know and names you don't know, but we think the names that you should know. And before we start, we want to acknowledge those who have certainly supported this program. Co-sponsors include Brandeis Law School organizations, including the Diversity Committee, Women's Law Caucus, and the Black Law Students Association. University of Louisville departments include the Office of Diversity, Office of Community Engagement, and the Office of Institutional Advancement. We would like to thank the following committee members, Dee Pregliosco, Robin Harris, Cherie Dawson, Clarissa Roberts, Valerie Mattingly, and co-chairs Les Abramson and Laura Rothstein. We would also like to thank the Brandeis Law School staff members, Jim Becker, Bethany Daly, Kyle Durbin, and Dean Colin Crawford. The program is sponsored by the Brandeis School of Law Medal Committee. And it was decided by the committee that in 2020, it would be appropriate to host a program on suffrage rather than award a Brandeis Medal to a single individual this year. It is noteworthy that there is a direct connection of Judge Louis Brandeis to the ratification. After the 1920 vote, there were challenges to the constitutionality of some of the state ratification votes. In 1922, the Supreme Court, in a unanimous opinion written by Justice Brandeis, upheld the constitutionality of ratification. At this time, we also want to let you know that we want to hear from you. We want you to submit some questions through the chat feature. They will be reviewed by Cherie Dawson, who is the chair of the Criminal Justice Department at the University of Louisville, and also Associate Dean for Diversity at the U of L College of Arts and Sciences. We're going to ask some of those questions after the presentation from some of our panelists. Now we want to get back to the suffrage and a little bit of the history that we're going to talk about so much today. Its beginnings, of course, were back at Seneca Falls, that convention that was way back in 1848. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, the organizers. A few years later, Susan B. Anthony joining and leading the early efforts with some individual states adopting a patchwork of voting rights for women for some elections. Now, the Commonwealth of Kentucky was among the first to grant women's suffrage, but that right was limited to school board elections, and that limited right was passed in 1891. It was repealed in 1902, passed again in 1912, but included an educational qualification that basically excluded African-American women. The recent book by Elaine Weiss, The Woman's Hour, it details the drama of the last month of August of 1920 when the battle was fought to make Tennessee the 36th state and the final state needed to ratify the 19th Amendment. If you remember, it came down to one vote and that one vote was a 24-year-old named Harry Byrne whose mother had urged him to be a good boy and vote in favor of the ladies. But what was forsaken in that final push for women to vote gender equality superseded racial equality. And many were okay to exclude black women from the advocacy efforts in order to carry support of Southern Democrats. African-American women and many others of color were indirectly barred from voting for years to come, even though they had long been part of the fight. Names on the national stage and in our state of Kentucky, and today we are going to talk about them. 
We're going to learn those hidden histories. We're going to say their names. We're going to learn about them and talk about the civil rights movement in the 1960s, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to today's Black Lives Matter protests, the interconnectedness of all of this, and of course, to voting. Our panelists today are all accomplished and their resumes are long. I'm going to shorten them just a little bit because of time, but viewers can obtain the full information on the speakers as well as bibliography of references on this issue by going to the Brandeis School of Law webpage, and that is library.louisville.edu forward slash law forward slash women's hyphen suffrage, and follow the link to Right to Vote and Women's Suffrage for a summary of all of these resources. Now to our panelists. They include Dr. Margie Cherisica, the past president of the National Council of Negro Women Louisville section, and the current president of the League of Women Voters of Louisville. Jermaine Fowler, one of the nation's up and coming historical storytellers and public editors, educators. He is a Louisville native shining the light on hidden and underrepresented histories with his website and his podcast, The Humanity Archive. We also have Marsha Weinstein, whose suffrage history journey began 25 years ago as executive director of the Kentucky Commission on Women. She's currently the president of the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites and developing a National Votes for Women trail. Her expertise has proven invaluable to us at the Fraser with our exhibit that's on display now. And then our fourth panelist, Enid Trucios Haynes, a professor at the Brandeis School of Law. She teaches constitutional law and immigration law. She is also the director of the Muhammad Ali Institute for Peace and Justice and the co-principal investigator and co-director of the Cooperative Consortium for Transdisciplinary Social Justice Research. She had the opportunity to interview the late Congressman John Lewis in 2013 on the University of Louisville campus when he was here for the Kentucky Author Forum. John Lewis was also awarded the Brandeis Medal in 2000. So today the program will reflect on John Lewis, all of the women of suffrage and the current protests that continue to fight for equity and justice and of course, good trouble. We also would like to recognize with sadness that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg who also received the Brandeis Medal in 2003 for her leadership on women's rights and advocacy for the importance of voting. We're going to start with Enid, though. We want to frame this discussion really as a continuum, that interconnectedness that we're talking about, what we've seen from the past with the 15th Amendment to the 19th, the Voting Rights Act to present day, and the legal issues that really framed it from the start. Enid, that's a lot to tackle, but let's talk about, about the progression and the interconnectedness, if you don't mind, of all of this to begin us. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and to everyone who's participating on the panel and all of the organizers. So I think the best way to think about um, this journey is a journey toward equal citizenship. It begins with the 13th Amendment um, that was adopted in 1865, then the 14th Amendment adopted in 1868, and then the 15th Amendment adopted in 1870. And I and the 20th, uh, 2020, it, excuse me, in 1920, the adoption of the 19th Amendment. What I was trying to say is that this is also this year, the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, in addition to the 100th anniversary of the, of the uh, 19th Amendment. So when we think about equal citizenship rights from the abolitionist movement to the present, we're talking about legal issues that were framed in the beginning through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. So as we remember, the 13th Amendment um, abolished the enslaved of people in the United States. The 14th Amendment, through its citizenship clause, um, nullified the Supreme Court's decision in Dred Scott versus Sanford that held that black people who were born in the United States, regardless of their status, could never be citizens of the United States. And then the 15th Amendment, guaranteeing the right to vote will not be denied based on race or color. Another way to frame this issue is thinking about the fractured coalition that resulted from the passage of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment explicitly states that only male voting rights, male inhabitants who were 21 years of age and citizens of the United States would be recognized and as having um, being able to participate in voting. And that split the movement, um, the abolitionists and the uh, women's suffrage movement, because many of the women leaders refused to vote 
to advocate for the 14th Amendment because it did not include women's voting rights. That coalition was further fractured with the passage of the 15th Amendment and the advocacy for that because that also did not explicitly recognize the women's right to vote. A third legal issue that is, is throughout this time is the consistent efforts to repeal the 14th and 15th Amendments. Um, that happened decades after the 14th and 15th Amendments were enacted. There was still that effort to repeal, as well as um, through up to the passage of the 19th Amendment. And the arguments that were made against both the 19th Amendment and to repeal the 14th and 15th Amendment were similar. Um, there was an op there was opposition to having ignorant and unfit voters uh, joining the voting rolls. The idea that there would be influence by new voters, particularly black women who were singled out, as well as immigrants and other urban workers. And also on the road to the enactment of the 19th Amendment, we heard uh, Rachel mention that many states did provide for voting rights, but also similar to Kentucky, other states excluded black women from those voting rights that were recognized. And so um, I would say from that perspective, I, what black women understood was that both the 15th and 19th Amendment were necessary together to ensure their voting rights and that saving the 15th Amendment and extending the right to vote um, for women with the 19th Amendment were two fronts of the same fight. But as we all know, after the adoption of the 19th Amendment in uh, 1920, black women and black men were still denied equal citizenship, as particularly in the South through the widespread violence and intimidation that limited voting rights for all black people in the US. So that's the bit broad framework and that continued until uh, the 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, eliminated some of the most egregious uh, voter suppression efforts that happened throughout the South and other places in this country and continues today through efforts to uh, reinvigorate the Voting Rights Act that was decimated recently by the Supreme Court in its decision striking down provisions of the Voting Rights Act and the preclearance procedure for reviewing the those states that were formerly engaged in explicit segregation in their voting practices and reviewing their changes in their voting districts. So that's a brief history and uh, I hope that helps explain some of the framework for this discussion. It really does. Thank you so much. It's tough to put all of the history in this in just a few minutes. So we recognize the challenge of that with all of our panelists today. Marcia, I want to get with you with the women's movement, the broad context of how it started. Then when those fractures started develop, to develop and why learning all of this history and the factions is so relevant today. I'm, I'm not sure we knew all of the factions always. It seems like more, we're learning more and more about it. Um, so go ahead and talk about that if you don't mind. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Rachel and Eden. Thank you. I learned some things I didn't know just from hearing you speak. And I have been researching and engaged in trying to tell everybody I know about the history of the suffrage movement for 25 years and I continue to learn more. So that's really important. I s uh, tell you in terms of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she grew up in upstate New York in Johnstown, New York. Her father was a lawyer and a judge and they lived across the street from the courthouse. So she was around a lot of law students and also a lot of women would come to her father and be crying and upset because at that time, of course, women couldn't own their own property or have any money available to them. So their husbands would maybe drink all the money and they couldn't feed their children. And so her father kept telling the women about the laws in those books, the laws in those books. And so Elizabeth, one day at nine years old, decided that she would get those bad laws out of those books and get some scissors and cut them up. And then she'd solve the problem and help these women. Well, of course, her father explained to her about the law and about how legislation was passed. So then she knew what she had to do later in life is to go lobby Congress and really learn important civic lessons. Well, she was also very involved in the abolition movement because of her uh, cousin, and she met Henry Stanton, who was a big abolitionist, and they got married in 1840. And they for their honeymoon, where else would they go but the anti-slavery world conference in London? And of course, she was very excited to go to this event that you know she felt so strongly about. But when she got there, 
she was not allowed to participate. All the women could only sit in the balcony with a curtain drawn. But at this, uh, during this uh, convention, she met Frederick Douglass, who came and sat with the women because even though he was a male, he could participate. He chose to side with the women. And she also had the opportunity to meet Lucretia Mott, a Quaker, who was also a big abolitionist. And they decided when they got back to the U.S. that they would have the first women's rights convention, which they did eight years later. And Elizabeth and the women took the uh, Declaration of Independence and changed it to say all men and women are created equal. And so uh, through the years, uh, a lot of efforts were made to explain why it was so important that women got the right to vote. And Frederick Douglass was at Seneca Falls. He was very supportive of them, and they were very, very close. And then when the 15th Amendment passed, what they were really upset about is for the first time in the Constitution is they included the word man. And the word man meant that it would set back the suffrage movement for a long time. So that the amendment was passed in 1870. And then, of course, it was 19, 20, 50 years later that they did get the right to vote. And I understand that the intersection of race and gender is, it's been ugly, really ugly. And I'm not going to you know, defend the white women. Um, and they did create two separate uh, organizations, the American Suffrage, led by Lucy Stone, who thought they should take a state-by-state -state approach, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony that uh, wanted it to be a federal amendment. So that's kind of the broad context of how it came to be. Um, and why is this important to learn? I th first of all, the more I learn, the more I really appreciate the intersection of gender and race and all the problems that continue today. But also, I think it's important to learn because it inspires people to become actively engaged and see how people at local levels can be involved and the importance of civics and government being taught in school. Because when you learn what our foremothers and did and some of the forefathers, it makes you too also want to contribute. So that's why I think this history is so important and that we really appreciate how difficult it is for social change to take place. But actually, everyone is responsible to being engaged and being part of improving this nation. All right, Marcia, thank, thank you so much. Jermaine, we want to talk to you. You're such an advocate of these hidden histories and many histories that are underrepresented. We want to talk about um, the tensions with African-American women, if you can kind of address that, and specifically through the lens of, of one person in a name we know, and that would be Ida B. Wells. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, first, I want to say I appreciate the invitation to be here to talk about such a very important topic and a topic in history that I don't think is talked about enough through the lens of black women who participated in the suffrage movement. And also kind of uh, always think about all those unnamed women, all those unknown women who laid the foundation, you know, those women who stood in the crowds, those women who knocked on the doors, those women who held the banners who will never know, because those are the women who are people like you and people who are like me, who are the ordinary everyday people who stood up for suffrage, but there are uh, so many names of black women that I, that I could name, you know, as far as those who were on the forefront of the suffrage movement. You had those like uh, Mary Church Terrell, you had those like Carrie Langston, who was Langston Hughes's mother, the famed poet's mother. So he came from a long tradition of freedom fighting of the black freedom movement. You had those like, um, you know, uh, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, but one woman that I focused on because I focused on a lot of biographies in history and how people, individual people, find themselves within the larger context of history. So I focused on the story of Ida B. Wells. Who was Ida B. Wells? She was a fierce anti-lynching advocate. Um, whenever Black people were being terrorized, you know, in the uh, the 19th century, in the early 20th century and beyond, you know, through Jim Crow, she stood up and she stood and she wrote as a journalist and really wanted to expose this terrorism in such a way where she bore witness to the suffering of black people, you know, black people being lynched every week, uh, you know, in this American atrocity. So uh, she wrote a classic called A Red Letter, 
or a red record and she also wrote a southern whore um two two uh literary classics that i very much encourage people to look up to to kind of see where she was and, and how she advocated for anti-lynching but she also was a suffrage is and uh where do we find her in 1913 we find her at the women's procession in new york or uh, washington dc she um traveled from chicago 700 miles to march with the white women there in solidarity for women's suffrage and then we see what does courage do in the face of exclusion because what did they tell her when she got to this march in washington they said if you're black you have to march at the back you can't march up front with us in this women's march and she said i'm not going to do it she said i'm, I'm going to keep my dignity i'm going to keep my pride i'm just going to step out of this procession altogether even though she had traveled all that way to be there and then she got the courage she in the middle of the procession she got up front and we see a picture of her you can look up online where she's in the front of the procession where she came out of the crowd and went ahead and got in and took her place and said i want suffrage too you know i'm going to fight for suffrage too even though you are not fighting for suffrage for everybody i'm still going to take my place and fight for suffrage not only for black women but embrace suffrage for everybody and i think that's the key that i see over and over uh with these black women groups you know what does courage do in the face of exclusion they form their own groups whenever they are excluded from these white suffrage groups but they didn't do it in such a way where they were doing it to exclude they still fought for everyone and themselves so this is a running theme i think in the uh the history of the black freedom movement uh freedom for everybody democracy for everybody equality for everybody and that's what i see in the story of ida b wells uh, not only a fierce anti-lynching uh, advocate, but also a suffragist from history. And two things with that, Jermaine. So many things that I even see on Facebook now with the current movement that people are really giving credit right now to strong Black women being such an integral role of what is happening in our own community that we'll be talking about as well. And one thing I wanted to point out, of course, with Ida B. Wells, she just recently posthumously received the Pulitzer Prize for her reporting on, on the lynchings. And one note, her obit was not included in the New York Times when she died when in, in 1931, worth noting as well. But she did receive that Pulitzer Prize recently, and I know that had to make a lot of people happy that finally there was some recognition of this amazing life. So Jermaine, thank you for educating us about Ida, and we're going to continue with this education. Margie, I want you to take on the important name in Kentucky, Mary Britton, and what she represented, and give us an education a little bit about her. Oh, my delight, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me here today with this these notable, I mean, and knowledgeable panelists. Um, Mary Britton, who was born in 1855, just 10 years before the end of the Civil War, and died in 1925 at the age of 70, just five years after ratification of the 19th Amendment, spent much of her adult life fighting for equity and justice for African American people. She was an active participant in the women's suffrage movement which led her to present a speech at the 1887 Kentucky Negro Education Association, also known as KNEA. This uh, speech was entitled, Woman's Suffrage, a Potent Agency in Public Reform. The words potent agency in public reform is noteworthy because it brings to our attention that this movement was more than women just wanting to vote for the sake of voting. She and many others understood the power behind the vote. It was potent. Miss Britton was born in Lexington, Kentucky, actually to, to free African-American parents, though Kentucky was a slave state. In some ways, she was rather privileged. Her mother, who was biracial, instilled in her a love for education, music, and public service. She was certainly cultured, but she was also bold, courageous, and a trailblazer. At a time when those attributes, as it is today, carried with it a certain level of risk. Professionally, she was a teacher. She and her sister were the first African Americans admitted to and Gretman who were able to graduate from Berea Academy, now known, of course, as Berea College. After teaching in Lexington for a few years, 
she went on to become the state's first African-American physician whose practice was located in her home. And I emphasize located in her home because African-Americans were not allowed in the segregated hospitals of that time. So though she was well-educated, she still experienced racial discrimination and inequality directed toward Black Americans, which is still evident today. All right, Margie, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And Marsha, I want you to jump in on this because Mary Britton, there are now markers. Give us just a, a, a brief overview of those markers that we're seeing now in the state of Kentucky and Mary Britton is among them. Right, Margie, thanks so much about the excellent uh, history of Dr. Mary Britton. The, I am the president of a national organization called the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites and our to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, we created a National Votes for Women's Trail. So in Kentucky, uh, we were also given roadside markers. So we got to highlight the suffrage story in Kentucky. So we put a marker for Dr. Mary Britton in Danville in front of an African-American church where she gave a speech in 1887 uh, to the, uh, just like Margie had said, to the uh, local uh, African-American Women's Association. And what was so heartwarming is the minister of this church, he did not know this history about um, Dr. Britton being there and speaking to the, uh, actually it was the Colored Teachers Association is who she, he, she was speaking to. So, uh, and I think he was very pleased to know that someone cared about their history and was sharing it. And we've also put markers up for um, Susan Look Avery in Louisville who started the Women's Club of Louisville, but she also started the Louisville Suffrage Association. And Susan Luke Avery wrote a, an excellent paper about the importance of abolition and, and she was very supportive of African Americans' rights. So she was very progressive for that time period. Uh, then we put a marker and at the White Hall, the Cassius Clay home, which is, uh, he was a big abolitionist and his older daughter, Mary Barclay, was really the first suffrage leader in Kentucky that brought in Susan B. Anthony and was also president of a national suffrage association. And then we put in one in Josephine Henry in Versailles, Kentucky, who really got women the right to voting, got women the right to own um, their own property before women got the right to vote. And then at Ashland, we put in a marker for Madeline Breckenridge. She was the great, great granddaughter of Henry Clay. So we've got a rich, powerful suffrage history in Kentucky. And what's been really good that when we've done this nationwide, we are really adding to the body of knowledge of American history because we are learning about all the different ethnic groups that fought for the right to vote. Um, the African-American women's stories we're telling. We're telling the stories of Latinas. We're telling the story of Native Americans and Asians. And it's it was a national story with all these grassroots efforts and it's never been told. So we really feel like what our work is very significant that we're recognizing the contributions of all people. And it truly took a national grassroots effort to, uh, to get the right to vote. And even though some people, uh, Asians didn't, until 1952 and a lot of later dates like that, but they helped the white women get the right to vote. So I'm just totally grateful for all the people that have contributed so much for us to enjoy the privileges we do today. You know, that kind of set up my next question, Marsha, because we're talking about the fuller history and those mm -hmm. compromises that were made pursuing the vote for the majority of American women, those moral compromises that we've already right. talked about. So the question that I want to ask each of you, can the suffragists use of raci uh, racist rationales to win support of Southern legislators be justified? Now that we're talking about that fuller history and we're finding out um, just all of the different groups who got that right, but some were forsaken along the way. So let's talk about those compromises. Who wants to do that? Can suffragists use of racist rationales to win support of Southern lawmakers be justified? Who wants to be the first to take that one on? Rachel, I'll take that one. All right, Margie. You know, I'm struggling. I have to admit, I'm struggling with the word justified. Uh, I cannot agree that it was right 
but I do believe to some degree that it was necessary. Given the view of women in general at the time and the competing struggle for freedom fought by the abolitionists, politics quid pro quo played a part, but we can't deny the underlying racism and biases by the practices that were openly embraced and apparent as well. Margie, thank you, because that's interesting. So the word justified is what caught you up. Necessary is the word that, that you said, maybe you would substitute that. Enid, what about you? Tell me what word you prefer, or you just answer the question however you want. Apologies for a technical issue right there. Uh, you know, it's, this is something we talk about in constitutional law, the role of justices and judges in their states who opposed um, slavery and were vocal opponents in decisions that were issued. And I think many apologize for the views of people who hold the majority view of their society in the time that they've lived. But in my view, there are always voices that speak to pervasive inequality and advocate for broader social justice and that too often we don't listen to those voices. So uh, I understand the political calculus that was made. Uh, I can't endorse it. And I applaud Ida B. Wells and others who demanded to be at the front of the line and not the back of the line. Jermaine and, and Marsha, let's have each of you weigh in. Jermaine, you want to take that first and then we'll end with Marsha on that one? Yeah, I absolutely don't agree that it was justified. Uh, you know, ultimately, if you look at the history of uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and um, Susan B. Anthony, they actually started a group uh, in the beginning. It was called the Equal Rights Association, for which Frederick Douglass was the vice president of this group. And what was their mission statement? Their mission statement was equal uh, suffrage for everybody, regardless of race, gender, class, uh, et cetera. So where did that rift come in where they abandoned their original moral principles? They abandoned friends like Frederick Douglass. Um, they abandoned friends like Sojourner Truth for this political expediency of trying to push forward the suffrage uh, vote for women, right? But it wasn't for all women, it was only for white women. So I look at it as uh, almost like Darth Vader going to the dark side, right? Where they just kind of kind of flipped over from their original moral principles, uh, you know, to push forward the, the right to vote for white women. I think it was uh, Susan B. Anthony who was quoted as saying, I would chop off my right arm before I would stump for a, a black man to vote over a woman. So um, in hindsight, I think it left a stain on the legacy of the movement. Uh, it's something that we can learn from to where we can see that we do need to find more solidarity and more connectedness and push forward uh, initiatives for the equality for everyone instead of just one group, uh, you know, as opposed to another group or, or try to find ways where we can work together as opposed to to splitting and, and doing what we see as expedient or may move us towards some goal quicker, but also at the same time trampling on the rights of other people. Arsha, your thoughts on it? Well, absolutely. They started out for universal suffrage for all people and then it wasn't to be and so it was really ugly and unfortunate and i feel very bad about the division but i mean they frederick Douglass and susan b anthony and elizabeth did come back together later in life so I, i'm glad about that and but it was unfortunate and that's why we need to know the history how this was ugly and bad and how we can change it going forward together and especially in light of black lives and all this racial turmoil it is more important than ever that all people work collaboratively together for the good of the betterment of all people and so um, we do need to recognize what happened and move forward together and i those lessons though you know it isn't just history right you see it playing out Right. over and over again, even in modern day uh, right. uh, times. That's why I think knowing those fuller stories, how can you not know them? And it, I, I think, you know, it's time that we all know all of it. We want to move on to the 50s and 60s, the Civil Rights Movement and the Voting Rights Act, which for many was still about the struggle to vote and removing barriers. We want to talk about some of the movers and shakers of this era. And Enid, let's start with you on that, if you don't mind. 
well, as you said in the introduction, I did have the opportunity to interview John Lewis when he was here in 2013. And it was one of the most moving experiences I've had in my life. Um, just to be on a stage sitting next to him and recognizing the power of the work he did in collaboration with so many others as part of the Long Black Freedom Movement, it it really uh, really made an impression. Um, of course, I knew his work, but just to be there with him. And so I do find his work um, particularly moving, how un his uncompromising stance, his approach to nonviolence to try and come at the question of gross and blatant inequality from a loving perspective, as he said, but without conceding anything. And so, uh, and and what he did resonates today, as he said in that final opinion piece that um, was published after his death, that for him, his George Floyd was Emmett Till, that that murder made him realize that he had to stand up and be part of the change that he wanted to see. And so that's the lesson from the 1950s and 60s that resonates most for me today. We all have to stand up and be part of the change that we want to see. Nina, just one one quick follow up with you on that. You know, the word that you <clears throat> used, uncompromising. Is that a word that you think we use a lot today with people when we describe them? I think that's one thing that I think is why he resonated with so many was because of that uncompromising, that word you used. Well, I, I think to follow up on something that Jermaine said, it is that quest for equality for all that John Lewis continued throughout his life. Um, he didn't see his um, his advocacy for black voting rights as just one piece. Of, it was for him a piece of a larger civil rights, social justice movement. And it's that interconnectedness and an unwillingness to say we are done because we have a Voting Rights Act or we're done because we've reached some goal, um, but, not, but that this is a long um, movement that needs to continue. Is that is something that I think speaks to the uncompromising nature that he brought to this challenge and struggle. All right, Enid, thank you. Margie, let's go with a name for, for you, um, movers and shakers of that era in the 50s and 60s. Who, who would you like to point to? Actually, I'd like to point out uh, the name of Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy Lee Jackson was, was a mover and shaker from my perspective, but he probably didn't even know that he was uh, or that he was would be described as a mover and a shaker. But uh, during a peaceful march, uh, while unarmed, he was beaten fatally and shot by Alabama police. His killing was captured on national media, leading President Johnson to send in federal troops to protect the marchers in Selma and to encourage the broad legislation for voter rights. <coughs> that was a turning point for the nation. So that was the name. Marsha, let's go with you, somebody who, who you would think of as a mover and shaker in the 50s and 60s. Well, these sisters in Louisville, the Nugent sisters, they were a little bit before that time period that no one, and I just recently learned of the Nugent sisters, that was Georgia, Alice, and Molly, and Ida. And they started the Kentucky chapter of the Federation of Colored Women's Clubs in the early 1900s. And we've just recently discovered, and their home is located on 6th Street, where they had Ida B. Wells and all the major women, African-American suffrage leaders come to their house and entertain them. And the fact that just like within the last six or months, I've discovered these women. And what's so exciting is that a Girl Scout, I learned it from a Girl Scout, who has got their house listed on the National Register for Historic Places. And they're also going to be getting a Pomeroy marker uh, to tell their story and their history to show these women have always been there, always working for <clears throat> rights for people, and no one has known them. So it's just so exciting to discover. I mean, one of my most recent discoveries was the Nugent sisters that I've just been delighted to learn about and want to share their story uh, with the larger community. And I love that, Marcia, because as you said, I mean, the education continues. It never stops. And, and the fact is much research that all of these panelists have done for you to be finding names still. I mean, I love that. The education continues. All right, Jermaine, how about a name for you? The first thing I always want people to realize about the uh, 50s and 60s is that it wasn't some isolated 
uh, two decades, you know, just kind of out in the middle of nowhere, like um, the 50s and 60s, if you look at the Black Freedom Movement, like a train on a track, you know, this this train started with the Phyllis Wheatleys, who were one of the first uh, Black women that we know of to pin uh, her thoughts on Black freedom way back, you know, around the founding of the nation. And then that train just keeps on chugging along right to the, the abolitionist movement. And you have names like Frederick Douglass, um, you know, those two movements being connected. And then you keep going on through Jim Crow. And then you get to the 50s and 60s with names like uh, Bayard Rustin and, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. and, uh, you know, Ella Baker. But the one name that I always, that stands out to me as a grand person uh, in the 50s and 60s is Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, born a, a sharecropper and, and got fed up, didn't even know that she could vote. And this is, uh, you know, in the 1950s and 60s that she was coming up. And this is somebody who really had a, a tremendous amount of courage to say, we're going to bring this uh, suffrage full circle because of course, as we know, 1965 Voting Rights Act, just bringing that all the way around where uh, there weren't so many barriers like, uh, you know, voter ID laws and voter suppression going on so much through the, the, the enactment of that law. And um, she's someone who got got beat for justice. She went to jail for justice, uh, you know, and and was injured in, in her eye, you know, for the rest of her life where she couldn't see uh, correctly. But um, she formed the uh, national uh you know, Democratic uh, Freedom Party from Mississippi. Uh, she she stood up, spoke out, said, again, that running theme, like, I want freedom for everybody. None of us are free until uh, all of us are free. So Fannie Lou Hammer is a name that I'd like to present to everyone to look more into. I love this. We're learning all these different names. We've heard of some of them, but but for many out there in the audience might not know some of these names. So that's always good to hear the new ones. All right. As we head into the November election, we're a country in turmoil, as we all know, with protests, calls of police brutality and voter suppression. And we all know that Louisville, of course, has received national attention because of the Breonna Taylor story. During the week in which this program is being presented, there has been increased attention, as we all know, on this issue. This attention highlights the importance of addressing the systemic discrimination, which often requires the action of elected officials, which only emphasizes the importance of voting, because voting, of course, is our means one way to address social justice issues. So with that framework, we want to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement and how this has roots in movements that have come before. We've talked about that interconnectedness. Now with what we're seeing locally and, and Black Lives Matter and nationally as well, let's take that on a little bit and interconnect it to past movements. And, and Margie, let's start with you on that if you're okay. Oh yes, okay, thank you. Um, I think it is very relevant, as it has been throughout history. Some, some want to pretend that they don't know what the phrase means, and maybe they don't. You know, I know it does not mean that the lives of non-Blacks are not important or valued. It means that we are tired of being discarded or treated as easily disposable or unimportant as apparent in problems associated with some policing, the criminal justice system, inequitable education, health care, on all aspects of life are created and designed to support the needs of the dominant group. People of color are growing rapidly, soon they outnumber those that are white. Still, whites are most often in positions of leadership, formulating policy and legislation that affects them more positively than those outside the dominant group. Jermaine, you want to pick up on that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think with the Black Lives Matter movement, what we see again and again and how it's connected is we we have these catastrophic uh, historical moments, right? Uh, whether that be uh, Rosa Parks, whether that be George Floyd, and then you have movements that already existed. Remember, I, I made that analogy of a, a train right on a track of, of Black freedom uh, connecting all these movements from the civil rights movement to the Black Lives Matter movement. So you have this uh, catastrophic historic moment that really escalates uh, the movement to the forefront of society, um, you know, with, with the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, with George Floyd's, with the Breonna Taylor's. And um, you see people being more sensitive to black suffering as a result of, you know, the, these incidents and then these movements accelerating. So I think the Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, what really was uh, Phyllis Wheatley saying, Black Lives Matter, what was 
Frederick Douglass saying Black Lives Matter. What was Fannie Lou Hammer saying Black Lives Matter? Ida B. Wells, Black Lives Matter. That was at the core of what they were saying and the energy that they were putting forth is to put an end to black suffering, give black, black people equal rights, whether it be political rights, economic rights, whatever it is in all walks of social life, right? And, uh, you know, just pushing back against this social death of black people. So ultimately it all connects in with the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's just another manifestation and continuation of the black freedom movement uh, today. All the way back. Enid, let's have you pick up on that. Right, and I would say uh, to, re to reiterate is that it, the Black Lives Matter movement points us backwards to understand the deep racial injustice and history in our society. And it's on that train, as, as Jermaine mentioned, so clearly um, connected to prior movements to acknowledge and recognize the deep in historical injustice and connect it to what's going on today. And it is that persistent style of equal citizenship in all its permutations in every policy area that makes black life less valuable in our social settings, in policing as um, was commented on, in education and every uh, path that we see in our lives here in, in this U.S. society. So, and the systems that justify the death of a woman in her home at the hands of police uh, to bring it home to what happened here in Louisville. So it is a movement that connects us to the past and continues the demand for racial justice. Marcia, would you like to add anything on that? Well, yes, I would. The whole Black Lives Matters thing and the horrible stuff that's going on in this nation today, as horrible as it is, I think we're having a national awakening. And even, you know, as a white person, I don't really think I appreciated the depth and the breadth of the horror that so many people, Black people experience on a daily basis. And I think I probably know more about African American than most people. So it, it has been horrible, but because of this turmoil, I hope we're going to come out on the other side a stronger nation with respect for each other and value each other at a, a, a much higher level than we ever have. I want to throw something in here. You know, we talked about the power of the ballot box, and I've seen a lot of people on Facebook that that's the way we're going to get the change. Um, a lot of people pushing, we need people to run for city council. We need people to run for every office at every level. Do you think with this movement, that is where the power is, is in the ballot box and holding office and voting? So each of you, if you don't mind weighing in on that, Margie, with League of Women Voters, my guess is you've got something to say on that. <laughs> Definitely. Voting is the cornerstone or the bedrock of democracy. It, it's very important that um, we recognize that um, the power is in the vote. And so people, during this time, people are fearful. You know, some people are fearful for their health and well-being and may choose not to vote, which diminishes that power. And so, moreover, uh, persons must feel a level of trust in our institutions and systems. If trust is eroded, then voting is impacted. Um, I also believe that blind spots, which we all can have, everyone can have blind spots that work to also make us less aware of subtle acts of racism. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? The power in the ballot box and holding office. Mm -hmm. oh, I'd like to say something about that too. Um, <clears throat> So I think one of the most insidious things are those messages that we receive that our votes don't matter because mm -hmm. then we become disengaged and we don't think that we have the power that we can have through the ballot box. And also it reduces our belief in representative, our representative form of government, right? And our capacity to have a more inclusive democracy. And it is through the ballot box that we can make that happen. But you also asked the question about uh, what else is needed. And I believe in that we need both people inside who are elected leaders, but also those who are pushing our elected leaders to think broadly about their power and what they can do to end oppression and racism in our country. So mm -hmm. you, we need both, but we must engage in, in um, influencing policymakers through the voting process and, and having our own policymakers elected through the right. voting Marcia, process. Marsha, I'm gonna have, Oh, I'm sorry, Enid. Marsha, let's have you weigh in and then Jermaine the final word on that, if that's all right. Okay. Well, the, the right to vote 
is the right all other rights are gained. And what's really important to me is that we have a massive public education campaign for children in school. I do not think school children are being taught civics and government to the degree that they should. So we can create a future generation of in more engaged citizens that are very attuned to how public policy is made and who it benefits and who it doesn't benefit. Because unfortunately, with all this, I had a realization that most people don't understand how the, all these people on Wall Street have been able to rob from the American people for the fact they don't pay taxes and they put the burden. So the whole economic system that we live in and why we're taking advantage of that we've got to vote in order to change this and we've got to teach young people how the system works. Jermaine? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think Absolutely, we have our voice and our vote. I mean, these are really essentially the foundations of the power of the people. But I think where um, a lot of young people get disillusioned though is because sometimes voting is framed as uh, the end all be all of uh, you know democracy. And then whenever they see they vote and those changes don't happen either at all or as uh, quickly as they would like, they become disillusioned with the process, which um, you know I think that we have to be honest and say voting isn't the end but voting is an end and to kind of go with what Enid said you know you do need those outside pushes you know to continue uh, or, or to um you know work in 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 tandem with the, the voting process right you need grassroots roots movements you need a uh, civic engagement as many of the panelists have said you need a uh, you know education to show that this is not a stagnant process but this is an active process democracy is and it's a fluid process and something you have to continuously put effort forward not only through voting but also through uh bringing pressure to pressure to bear bearing witness to injustice uh questioning injustice and uh you know trying to make change in various ways instead of just only through voting you know, everybody says the next election election is the most important one. And I think we'd all agree that this upcoming election in November is very important. So we talk about the voter suppression issues, the um, absentee ballots, voter ID, polling hours, number of polling places. That has all been in play. We know Kentucky's plan right now. Weigh in as panelists, I guess. Is this a threat to our democracy or politics as usual? Uh, who wants to take that first? I would say it's always been a threat to our democracy, voter disenfranchisement, and um, it continues to be. The new forms of disenfranchisement, as you just mentioned, Rachel, are very present throughout this country, and the older forms were violence and repression. And so we, we need to see that it's all part of a connected history. And um, uh, we do not have a full democracy if we're, all of us are not do not have the equal opportunity to participate. And I will say it becomes so difficult right now with COVID, right? Because that has figured into this equation with that. Anybody else want to take on that issue of what is happening now with the talk of voter suppression, the absentee ballots? Uh, you can use the excuse of COVID, which is making it easier for people in this particular election. It's been interesting to see that we seem to have an agreement between the Secretary of State, who's a Republican, and the governor, who's a Democrat, a rather unusual agreement in, in this one. Have we done well enough in Kentucky for this election? Well, I, I do think that this opportunity to do more absentee uh, voting is really healthy because our previous system where a lot of people can't get off from work, there are a lot of barriers or, you know, child care issues. So in some ways, if we can shoot, prove this time that this absentee ballot should be the future and I've I think there's a lot of misinformation about it's not going to be counted and all these other issues. And we'll see how safe it is and how people's votes are included. included. So I think this is a healthy thing that we have more voting options and there's more awareness. Mm -hmm. Margie, Jermaine, either of you all want to weigh in on that? Well, I would just agree that we have to do everything. I, I know, for instance, the League of Women Voters, one of our primary goals is to make sure that we share information that the, that our, that our uh, constituency, our membership, and the public at large can, can trust. As I alluded to earlier, the trust is so important to getting people out to vote. And if they don't have that, uh, regardless of um, 
whether it be related to their health or related to the fact that they don't trust, you know, the systems in place, then they're just not going to vote. And I do, I do see it as a threat to democracy. Um, you know, I think that the state is taking steps this time, even more so than they did with the primary election. They're doing step, taking steps to try to alleviate some of the concerns. But then you have like the post office issues, and I think that does cause people to to pause and, and really second guess what processes they should take. Well, I'm still waiting on my absentee ballot, so I understand <laughs> that I think <laughs> as many of us are going, if we don't get that in time, because when we did a program at the Fraser with the Secretary of State, I mean, once you request that absentee ballot, then you really aren't supposed to go in person to vote, obviously. The question is, are we going to get it in time? So we're all kind of on pins and needles with that. Jermaine, did you have anything to add? Yeah, just briefly, I mean, I think ultimately the history would show us that we have to be suspicious of anything that obstructs or uh, adds undue dis uh, difficulty for someone participating in democracy, whether it be voting. So, I mean, if you have uh, groups of people, you know, who are who are the marginalized of uh, society who, who don't have an ease of voting, when we have the technology, when we have the resources for it to be easy for people to participate and vote, um, you know, I think we have to be suspicious of that in and of itself. And then, you know, you, you look at the history of voter suppression and uh, you look at how, you know, people are disproportionately affected in one group versus another by uh, the policies in place. And I think we have to be highly suspicious of that and look into that and, uh, you know, raise our voices uh, in advocacy for an ease of the, the democratic process through voting where it should be easy for everybody. And that's where voter ID following this year, I'm sure is going to become a bigger issue in the state of Kentucky on that. The Woman's Hour that we talked about, the book by Elaine Weiss, describes an important step in our country's evolution as a democracy. What other steps does our democracy still need to take? Anybody want to tackle that one? That's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think one of the lessons from the Women's Hour, and I um, had the privilege of listening to Elaine Weiss speak at a ABA, American Bar Association presentation earlier this month or in late August. And um, someone from the audience asked her about, you know, what are the lessons to young people for change today? And, and she was great. She talked about persistence. And that's one thing that we saw in the women's suffrage movement all the different ways in which uh, the status quo was challenged through marches, through protests, burning effigies outside the outside the, wa the White House, but also to lobbyists, proposed legislation that was presented to state legislatures. It was really effective and strategic. And, and that's a lesson that not to turn away when we're not successful in one arena, but that change happens across a variety of different fora. Um, and so to be, to be mindful that we can use all of those different ways. And um, she, this is Elaine Weiss, also said optimism is a key as well, that um, you have to have a sense of humor, you're not going to win all the time, and that mentorship was a key for women's, the women's suffrage movement of mentoring the next generation. So it was generations of people who had the history, who understood the battle, and were, were joined together and saw that connection to history. So those are great ways to think about how Black Lives Matter today and other social justice movements uh, feel that connection to the past and how important it is to have that mentorship for the future and, and to be optimistic, to believe that change can happen. Marcia, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Right. And I also believe that you have, you know, have to be persistent. And I think that's why I promote and so strong in teaching the history of the suffrage movement is you see how many years you just cannot give up. You have to continue and continue once we get rights to keep the rights because often minorities and women have been given rights and taken them away. So you have to never give up and believe that your actions and that a community-wide effort, a grassroots effort is the only thing that's ever changed this nation. So we can never um, say, well, I'm too tired. You must go forward. Well, tired of being tired. We've, we've heard that quote <laughs> a lot lately, right? And one thing that, that when you mentioned that, as far as never giving up, one thing that always struck me with the women's movement that I don't think I quite 
realized until we really started digging into it that many of those names at the very beginning, I mean, that fight was more than 70 years. And many of the names that we most associate with, you know, fighting for women to get the right to vote, they never got it. They died long before, you know, it was ratified in 1920. And I think, like you said, it was bigger than them and they recognized that. And I don't know, you know, I think the civil rights movement was kind of the same thing. You realize that it was bigger than any one individual. It was them fighting and not giving up that persistence that Enid brought up and, and optimism that one day they would get it. You know, the other thing you said, Enid, was the mentoring, that next generation, making good trouble. We know it from John Lewis. And I know when my son interned in um, DC, John Lewis would talk to any young person who came up to him. And he had a conversation with my son. It was just outside of the Capitol or somewhere. My son, thought he was a rock star and went up and he mentored so many young people. Who are we mentoring today? Who are the future leaders to stir up that good trouble if you all had to name one or two? Uh, anybody now, Jermaine, who would you say? Who are those next leaders, that next level for us to stir up that good trouble nationally or, or locally? Um, I mean, thinking about this question, I, I think ultimately I would like to tell people that those leaders are in the mirror because um, even looking back at history, a lot of people weren't even recognized as the leaders that we recognized them in the time that they lived in. And a lot of people didn't get their roses until they were, were gone, right? As far as the recognition of their leadership. So we have to be able to look in the mirror and see the leaders in ourselves. And I think that just goes back to uh, the question about democracy, like what steps does it need to take? Well, there can't be any democracy without accountability. And it's up to the people to bring their voices to bear and bear witness to uh, injustice to bear witness to uh, the things that are happening in society around them uh, to bring the pressure to bear to the people who were voted in so that they actually work for the people themselves uh, you know and not their own interest or, or special interest right so I think we have to look to ourselves for the leadership as opposed to you know uh, any single individual and find the power in groups and grassroots movements and more mobilizing and organizing uh, to, to find the leadership. Uh, in today's movement. Can I tell you how much I love that answer? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Look in the mirror, people who look like me. I love that. That was a great answer. Anybody else want to join in on that? Marsha? Well, my two passions in life is the history of the suffrage movement and girls' leadership development. And I'm very grateful that I've been associated with a group that started a Louisville Girls Leadership Program 20 years ago. And I've seen some of these young girls grow up uh, being involved like Mary Kate Lindsay that works at the Fraser and does work. Um, Bailey Rose, who is an attorney in town and is um, uh, involved with the Democratic Party. And so I know that they're out there and it's like you plant seeds and they grow. And I believe that there are future women leaders. And the fact of all these young women that have run for Congress and won, uh, I'm very hopeful. Of course, we only have 25% of Congress are female, and we need to increase those numbers, not only of women, but of African Americans as well. So I do see hope on the horizon that uh, mm -hmm. more young people are stepping forward into these positions because we're leaving them in a pretty big mess. They've got a big mess to clean <laughs> up. <laughs> they better step up, right? they got a lot of cleaning up to do. I hate to say that too, but I agree. Enid or, or Margie, either of you all want to answer that question? I don't think I can say it better than Jermaine said it, so I will second <laughs> that. <laughs> I got to say, I love that too. How about you, Margie? I agree with Marsha. I think we see the leadership. We, we see them every day uh, in Congress, and they're evolving as we speak. And so I just think that um, they're preparing every day to, to address the needs for the particular time that comes forward. All right, let me ask this question. 2020, we're still learning that full history that we talked about, those stories that are underrepresented. How do we ensure moving forward that we tell those stories um, moving forward? Why is it taking us so long? And do we finally get it? Jermaine, you want to start with that one? Because yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, um, and you ultimately, you know, the, the Jermaine, let me just, you obviously decided to tell these stories because they weren't being told. Yeah, that, that's what I do with the Humanity Archive uh, website and podcast is uh, just me recognizing that uh, 
unfortunately, I didn't hear a lot of, uh, or, you know, Black history until I got to um, African American African American studies classes in in college, which I look at as like a critical intervention where universities realize that this history wasn't being taught not only of uh, African American people, but you know, uh, other other marginalized and, and people around the world, right? So people are injecting these curriculums in, into college, but you still don't see them in the public school education as they need to be. So recognizing this, I kind of created what I created with the Humanity Archive. But um, I think unfortunately, there's a lot of people who are still in the party of denial, right? Because when you start looking at the history of black people, when you start looking at the history of indigenous people, when you start looking at the history of, of workers and immigrants, what do you see? I mean, you're going to be dealing with atrocity. You're going to be dealing with um, oppression. You're going to be dealing with some very hard truths and hard realities and, and difficult topics that um, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people want to deal with, right? So um, ultimately, we get the more patriotic history. We get the more, uh, you know, sugar-coated history um, where you had textbooks up to recently calling enslaved people workers. You have a uh, you know, history where you, um, you know, don't tell the full story, you only get half of history, so you only get at best a half truth, at, at worst you get outright lies. So I think ultimately we, we have to uh, be critical and have people open their eyes and be more open to hearing the full story, even no matter how difficult it is, uh, the truth is the truth and we have to tell the truth about history. There can't be reconciliation before the truth. As we all know, we've been hearing that. And you mentioned something that we've heard recently in the news, which is patriotic education. So I think that's interesting that those are the words that you used. Who else wants to weigh in on that question? Well, I would say, I think. Go ahead, Margie. We have to insist that we rewrite the narrative, that we deliberately um, approach history by sharing everyone that was involved so that everybody knows the truth. I think that even if it was in the schools at this point to the degree that we would want it to be, it would still not be complete. So rewriting the narrative is important. Enid? And I would say recognizing the intersectional way in which the denial of voting rights has happened. So we've talked a little bit about the history of the intersection of the 15th and the 19th Amendment. You know, immigrants were per denied the right to vote. And as you mentioned at the beginning of the program, Asians were not allowed, who were born in the United States, were not permitted to become naturalized U.S. citizens. We've had, and so, um, the racial exclusion is baked into the foundation of this nation and we need to to tell that story and all of the ways in which it impacts our policies today so our framers of the constitution talked about you know sending black people back to africa but also how talking about how uncivilized and savage um, Native American tribes were the, and how they didn't want to incorporate Puerto Rico because people were similarly uncivilized and savage there. So it is that narrative of exclusion that impacts so much of our policies today and it is truly intersectional. And uh, so I am encouraged by this history by making sure that we are retelling the history and it needs to be done constantly. And Marsha? Oh, absolutely. I, I think you, both the speakers have uh, it's described exactly what it is that this, we cannot just say, okay, we're through this time period. Now let's move on to something else. We've got to continue, stay earnest with continuing to tell these stories and valuing the history and to help people have an awakening of why you can't change the future till you know where you've come from and why it's this way. And when you understand the, the systems that have failed people, you, you can then determine what action can be taken to improve things. So only through knowledge and the knowledge of the history will we ever change uh, and make this a better nation than it is today. We are going to get to some audience questions here in just a moment. But one thing that I wanted from each of the panelists before we get to those audience questions, I wanted to end with your all's thoughts. Choose a name, maybe one that's come up, hopefully one that hasn't so much in this discussion, a name back in history with the suffrage movement who resonated with you. I want you to say that name and why it resonated with, with each of you. Uh, Margie, let's start with you. Who did you decide that you were gonna end with on your thoughts? Mary Search Terrell. She was a trailblazer, she was bold, and she was a fearless leader. She was not afraid to be first. 
She was the charter member of the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, as many of you know, NWCC. She was the first African American to attend and graduate from Oberlin College. She was the first African American appointed to the school board. She was the first African American member of the American Association of Universities. She was advocate for civil rights and suffrage movement. She served on a committee that investigated a, an alleged police mistreatment of African Americans. And she was an act, and her activism was sparked by the lynching of her friend, Thomas Moss, simply because his business competed with the white business in 1892. She did live long enough to see the um, board versus board of education ruling. And she also helped bring down segregated restaurants in Washington, DC. So she was she was persistent, she was courageous, and you know, what can I say? She was strong. All right, I love that choice. All right, Enid, how about you? Well, I would have said John Lewis, which I did before, but if I were going to uh, say right now, I'm not going to choose a person, I'm going to choose a larger movement, and I'm going to say the Black Lives Matters movement. Uh, the intersectional nation, nature of the movement, the idea of thinking about new ways to, to look at policy from across different perspectives and centering those who are marginalized, particularly black people, that is something that is inspiring to me today. And um, and because it's tied to our history, um, I think resonates broadly in our nation today. Jermaine? Yeah, I would say uh, Anna J. Cooper is a name that I would bring up because a lot of times when we look at the history of movements, we see uh, people who we might consider to be the fighters, right? The people who are on the front lines who uh, stood up, but Anna J. Cooper is someone who brought her intellect to bear, uh, you know, to fully express the condition of black women. Uh, in 1892, she wrote a, a classic in my, my mind, it was called A Voice in the South from a black woman in the South where she was able to very succinctly and uh, very uh, eloquently uh, in, in its uh, literature format and how she wrote it, uh, just just express the, the plight of black women during that time. So I would definitely highly recommend that. Anna J. Cooper and her work is someone to look into uh, about this, uh, you know, who, who rose up in the suffrage movement. And Marsha? Well, I have to say, I love Sojourner Truth. And she was there from the beginning. She was friends with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and those early women. She escaped as a slave. And what I'm so excited about that they put up in Central Park just August 26th, a statue of Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And I think it's symbolic about their friendship and how they work together. They may not have always agreed, but I really think uh, I've just always very been impressed. And I urge you to learn more about Sojourner Truth because she was really quite remarkable. And she was listed in the Smithsonian Magazine as one of the top 100 most important Americans. Those were all great choices. I'm going to get to some audience questions, and we have one uh, from Crystal, who is the Assistant Dean of Student Affairs and Diversity at Brandeis. And she asks, some scholars assert that affirmative action has had a greater impact on white women and their progress, especially in political power. With this privilege and in today's divisive climate, have we, women of color, lost a great amount of female support that will greatly impact voter suppression, or can we as women of color still feel optimistic about having a strong base as we battle these unfortunate barriers and setbacks? Enid, you're shaking your head. Sure. Did you have an answer? <laughs> Well, I think Crystal Coel's, um, Assistant Dean Coel's question points to a history that we see today as well and a challenge or a um, something that we all need to work towards greater collaboration to see the connections among all of the situations that we face as white women and women of color. Um, and so there are those challenges. There's no question about it, knowing our histories, but understanding the real material impact of our different experiences today in our society is something that has to be known in order to build those collaborations and make them stronger. Uh, again, I'm heartened. I think young people are leading the way as always, and they are very intersectional in their approaches. They see the connections very easily. And um, 
can help teach us how to move forward, I think. Anybody else want to address that one? All right, one other question. Won't the continued requirement of voter photo ID during COVID and allowing broader absentee ballots have an adverse impact on seniors, especially those in senior citizens who may not have a driver's license? That's an issue across the board, voter ID laws throughout the country. Uh, lack of access to the do underlying documents that are required. Um, lots of people don't have birth certificates, don't have driver's license, and it mostly disproportionately affects um, those who are economically disadvantaged and people of color. I know my mother was affected. She votes in New York City and she was born in Puerto Rico and was having to track down her Puerto Rican birth certificate, you know, when she's 80 something years old. Uh, these are real issues that are that are barriers to um, voting that people are experiencing today. Another question, even with the laws that have changed down through the years, people are still treated unfairly. What are your thoughts about that? Even with laws in place, basically, that have changed, people are still treated unfairly. Your thoughts? Jermaine, you want to start with that one? I think there's, I mean, you know, if you look down through the annals of history, there, there's always going to be unfairness, right? There's always going to be uh you know that 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 darkness to fight against, but I think we have to look at it as as a marathon and not a sprint. And uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, there, there's always going to be injustice, but we have to, you know, keep our fortitude. We have to keep hope and just know that through fighting, you know, and in believing that there's always good to be fought for. Um, you know, we we have to keep on pushing and look at it as a marathon and not something that's going to really have. Uh, 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 end in some, you know, far off paradise of, of, of equality, but ultimately it's there's always going to be injustice and there always needs to be people to stand up and fight against injustice, uh, you know, from here to to forever. Marsha, you had your hand up at the beginning. Did you have something to add to that? No, Jeremy did, did a good job. Yeah. All right. Anybody else want to take on that one? I agree that we'll always have some, in, you know, some uh, injustice or unfairness, but um, but I also believe that if we have a responsibility to continuously try to inform and educate the public, because sometimes it can be a basis of ignorance as much as, as it is deliberate. So I think that it's just an ongoing process, and I, I like what uh, was said that it's, it's, you know, it's an ongoing, it's a journey, it's, it's not um, a sprint. <laughs> We have about 10 more minutes. I'm going to bring up one question and, and you all tell me it's such a transformational time in our state and our country. Um, and I know everybody always thinks that there have, there have been pivotal times before. How would you place what we're going through in our in our state and what's happening in our city and then even on a national level right now with everything that is going on? How would you couch this as far as one of the most pivotal times Let's start with country first. How how would you couch this as being one of the most pivotal times in our history? Is it right up there? Uh, yes, I think that we're in a national transformation. I think it is probably one of the most um, disturbing and important uh, in terms of moving forward, of repairing this nation. And it's, and it's like a light has come on, an awareness that a lot of people were not didn't know about uh, and so i think this is pivotal in terms of how will we come out the other side it's going to be only through the work of good people caring people working collaborative will we improve this nation so it's like we're at a, a crossroads whether we're going to do what needs to be done to save this nation or we're gonna our democracy is going to be destroyed so the time is now if you've ever wanted to care about our country, you need to show it by being engaged and reaching out to your neighbor in any way possible to build this nation to the strong that it could be. All right, I see everybody's head shaking like, yes, 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 <laughs> everybody agrees. So let's talk. How does it rank to you all as far as pivotal, pivotal times in, in this country? Uh, Enid, how about you? Well, I can speak from my knowledge from teaching constitutional law and immigration law history, but uh, it, we we're in a time of a triple threat, you know, heightened awareness of racial injustice. 
which is front and center every day, similar to the Vietnam War where we saw the war on TV every day in the 1970s. We're also in the, in the midst of a historic health crisis, the pandemic, as well as you know, threats to our democracy in the lack of trust in major institutions, the devaluing of institutions, and it is a difficult time. This is, I see it as a significant threat and um, we need to gather ourselves up and make a difference in whatever way we can. And voting is a key way to do that. That's a start. Um, and, you know, we have a historic election coming up soon. So we need to act, all of us, and know that our votes make a difference. So that's, it is a transformational time. And, uh, Bob Woodward was here at the law school um, talking just before his book, his recent book came out. So uh, in October of 2019, and he said it was a dangerous time. And uh, and I agree. I think we we have a lot of threats toward to our democracy and, and we need to really make sure we're all acting. Margie, let's have you and then Jermaine and then we'll have like maybe time for a couple more questions and then I'm going to get a couple final thoughts from you. So Margie, go ahead and direct, address that. I agree. I would agree. I would agree everything that Ina just said, but I would also add that it is it, it's scary, it's dangerous, and it is a time where we need to to really understand the value of our vote because I think that our threat to democracy is at risk. And Jermaine? Yeah, I think it ranks right up there. Again, I, I use the term uh, catastrophic historic moment. And um, I think then the question becomes, you know, we have these moments in history, uh, not only do people have to really realize that, that we're living within that moment, but then what are the responses uh, going to be to the moment? And uh, ultimately we, we have to stand up again, we have to organize, we have to mobilize, we have to realize the moment that we're in requires um, power within the people um, and people recognizing their power to actually have some positive influence on uh you know preserving democracy on uh mending the fractures that are within democracy now or whether that be, be through voting or whether that be through forums like this um whether that be through just one-on-one -on -one conversations where they're trying to uh critically examine the views and thoughts of a family member who thinks differently to them and maybe trying to sway them toward a more democratic view whatever it may be i mean no matter how big or or small right because a small stone still makes a ripple they can send off across the whole lake so at the end of the day little big things i mean any any little thing anybody can do to participate in democracy is what's going to preserve democracy and to uh show uh whenever we look at this moment in history that we also responded uh how we needed to to make it through this this catastrophic moment in history you know we talked about the divide you you kind of uh, alluded to it and and try where do you find this common ground because the the divide is very big in this country right now. And I go back to the women's movement because they talked about persistence and optimism. So with the divide being as big as it is, is there optimism? Sometimes I, I know when I turn off the TV at night, I don't have a lot of hope. So what do you all feel about that? With the divide as big as it is, is there optimism? Is there still hope? Who wants to address that first? Well, I mean, I'm a very optimistic person and I always believe the best is going to happen, but only with everyone being involved. And I'm just hoping that this horrible situation is going to take us to a new level, a new level of understanding and respect for, you know, all people and to understand and learn like the whole Black Life Matters is to understand the experiences other people have had and to get out our outside of our comfort zone and realize that we may have lived a very privileged life, but not other, not everybody has. What what are our contributions going to be at the end of the day? What can we tell our children and grandchildren? And this is what I did during those times, because we're going to be held accountable, you know, for uh, this. And so everyone is responsible to do something. So um, that's the challenge. Who's next on that? Well, I hope that it's recognizing that the, our common humanity 
and it comes from projects such as Jermaine's where the focus is on everyday people and, and the names we don't know and the people who are working toward uh, change at, through collaboration and coalition building. It is the only way that change happens. So um, I think we have to get to that place if we want to see real change. And so we need to be working toward that end and find ways small and large to do that. We only have about five more minutes. I just kind of wanted to get final thoughts from each of you as we close of what we learned from this conversation and the movement that we've talked about today and how we can apply those lessons moving forward. Um, anybody want to start with that? <laughs> I would start. I will say that it is an ongoing process is an ongoing journey. We're not the, where we are located today is not the beginning. It's just a part of history through from the past and forward. And so I would say that there is, we have hope as well as we have um, trust and belief in one another. Thank you, Margie. Mm -hmm. Enid, your final thoughts as we start to wrap up? I would agree and concur that optimism is important and a belief that the institutions can be changed in a way that will address longstanding historical inequalities. And I, I believe that. I, I believe that our institutions can change and that we can find a way to work together. So it, it's inspiring to see how long as we examine the women's suffrage movement and how long it took and how many people did not live to see the results. And we know that's true of the long black freedom movement. And so we are all, many of us have been engaged in this challenge and may not see the end, but it's an important important uh, struggle to be part of and with optimism and hope as as our guiding <laughs> principles. Marcia? Well, I do believe that we will see better days and that we will come out on the other side a, a much stronger and compassionate nation. So that is my prayer. That is what um, I'm personally taking on as my challenge is to look at other ways that I can be engaged to bring people together and collaborate because you're right collaboration is the key word that we all hold hands together and move forward together and Jermaine yeah I think the the one lesson uh if there was one takeaway from the suffrage movement or uh you know any movement for change is that it all boils down to ordinary everyday people organizing mobilizing for change, whether that be massive resistance to uh, segregation, whether that be massive resistance to, uh, you know, people trying to uh, oppress people's right to vote, whether that be massive resistance to police brutality, whatever that is, it's, it's ordinary, everyday people just like you and me coming together, uh, mobilizing and, or and organizing for that change. So that's what I want people to get out of this and make sure that you participate in, in those resistance movements. Uh, or in, in democracy as a whole. Well, we thank you all so much for your wisdom today, introducing us to, to people perhaps that we hadn't heard of in, until today. I think we would all agree as we close that we definitely need to vote uh, and be an active participant. But Jermaine, I think that your words um, will end with, if you're okay with that, if you wanna be the change agent, just look in the mirror because That's you're perfect. the one. So thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you all. Hope you learned something today. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you.